Hi, it's Steve Riley. Welcome to this episode of Great Practice and Great Life. I've got a little stress going on in my life because some of my clients and some of my colleagues are feeling some pressure from the economy. And so I'm pivoting some of the content in our podcasts to help you as best I can to have a great practice and a great life. But more importantly, uh, think about your practice in the context of protecting profitability and income. And so I'm going to walk through a series of podcasts that right now I'm just going to call Lawyers and Money, for lack of a better word. And maybe you'll get a, a snazzier title as it develops. But today's story is about an attorney named Reggie. And I'm going to take some liberties with Reggie's story. I couldn't get him on the podcast. And uh, hopefully no one will come back later and be upset and correct some of my factual interpretations of Reggie's story. There's always a possibility of that, but I've done the best I can. I'll have sites. I'll give you some PDF um, support. I'll give you some information so you can cross-check my information about Reggie and Reggie's story. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is <laughs> there's an old Mark Twain quote that I get a big charge out of, which is nothing spoils good story like the arrival of an eyewitness. <laughs> so there may be an eyewitness out there that may be able to uh, corroborate or dispute my story about Reggie. But it's factually correct. So here we go. Reggie was a young lawyer and he graduated from law school after clerking at a firm for a couple of years. And he was an idealist. He was passionate about the law. He was passionate about bringing justice to the poor. He was passionate and a very, very bright guy. And Reggie, when he goes to the firm, quickly becomes the managing attorney of the firm. And the place is a mess. It's a mess. He's got about 2,000 cases. He's got a couple attorneys. He's got a paralegal. He's got a legal assistant. And the place is in disarray. Uh, you know, it's kind of like herding cats. He can't figure out what to do. He can't figure out where to go. So Reggie does something very clever. He realizes he's got a problem and he goes and hires a coach. Now, in this case, he hires a coach by the name of William Morse Cole. And William is actually a management professor at the school he just graduated from. So Reggie and William come up with a series of plans, and they really came up with about eight core strategies. And I want to walk you through these strategies because these strategies are applicable in about any law practice at any point in time. Number one, they put in tighter accounting systems. Now, Professor Cole argued as his coach that it was really hard for Reggie to manage others if he didn't understand the numbers. And he said that the numbers were a mess and he couldn't figure out what was going where and he couldn't figure it out. So he told Reggie to go get your numbers and go know your numbers. Now, you've heard me joke about this. Accounting is a methodology. It's not a religion. So when Professor Cole and Reggie start looking at the numbers, they start asking questions about how to manage the effectiveness of things. They start asking questions, how do we figure out if a case is costing the money, losing money? How, how, how's this case working? And so Professor Cole told Reggie, quit worrying about being a great lawyer and focus more right now about how the cases process through the practice and who is doing what. So he encouraged Reggie to have the lawyers track their time. Now, I know this is not shocking, but the lawyers, of course, rebelled. The lawyers were too busy to track their time, too busy to figure out what they were doing, too busy, too busy, too busy. And so Reggie persistently and consistently got them to start tracking their time. And then Reggie also started to track the flow of a case. So what Reggie did was track the process of a case. And this is really important because Reggie tried to figure out how long does a case go from point A to point B and what it happens to those cases. How much time does that case spend on a desk? Some of you have heard that term before, time on desk. And so he started to do a process map to figure out how these cases flow through the firm and then what they could do to cut the time. 
Then they also had the problem of where are the files at? <laughs> because the lawyers were hoarding files on their desk. Records were in different places. Things weren't being filed properly. And so Reggie had to wrap his hands around getting a record keeping system and a filing system that made sense so everybody could find everything quickly. And no one was running around like a chicken with their head cut off trying to find a record, a file, a pleading, what have you. And then the next strategy is a big one. There's a big strategy right here. Um, some of you may want to write this one down. This one's pretty good. They implemented a weekly meeting with the attorneys and the staff. So everyone knew what was going on that week. So they had a weekly meeting that they basically checked in with everybody, talked about progress on cases, talked about what they need to do this week, and basically had a weekly meeting to make sure things were flowing properly. Now, there were creating additional cascading meetings among the team when they did this, but there was one core meeting that Reggie led with the attorneys and the staff every week. The next thing that happened is Reggie implemented a new management control process. Who touched the case, when they touched the case, and why they touched the case became a big question for Reggie. Now, naturally, the staff and the lawyers hated this, but Reggie persevered. Reggie persevered because he needed to figure out how these cases were flowing and why they were taking so long and what was happening. Why were, why were lawyers wasting time on certain things? Now, what happened is within 24 months, 24 months, two years, Reggie increased the flow through the amount of cases going through this firm, firm by 65%. And then he reduced the cost by two and a half percent. Think about that. That is alone, a 65% increase in flow is incredible production, just incredible. But cutting costs to a half percent at the same time is really, really remarkable. Now, the crazy thing about this is Reggie did it with no increase in staff, no increase in budget. And he was having some pricing resistance in the market and hit upon an idea. And he decided to try a different pricing model. So he came up with the idea of doing cost of an hour plus. So he said, well, it costs me an hour to do this. And I want to make a profit margin of Y. And so what he did was come up with a way of pricing per hour to do work. And so basically, he kind of innovated with a cost plus time approach. Now, in Reggie's mind, this was logical, provide a fair, transparent, and indisputable method for valuing legal services. It's one he thought clients could embrace and understand as readily as the lawyers themselves. And he thought the method, and, he quote, and I'm quoting him in this, the method would be especially pleasing to business people, all who have cost accounting systems of their own. You can show them your cost, and you can give them your supporting evidence, and this dispels the notion that you're going to charge whatever the traffic can bear or whatever the market can bear, I guess. So here we have Reggie going rogue. Reggie goes nuts. He goes crazy, and he comes up with a different pricing model. Now, at the time, bar associations – and they kind of still do today, we're regulating what lawyers could charge. And at the time, the bar associations controlled how much a lawyer could charge. And all law firms at that time were charging fixed prices. So here goes Reggie with a different pricing model. He went broke. And all of his friends thought he was nuts. Some of his partners thought he was stupid, but over the next 20 years, they integrated this billable hour model into their partnership. And over time, the firm grew to 17 partners and eight associates. And about this time, the ABA comes along because at the time, lawyers were struggling and doctors were making and still do making more money. Dentists were still making more money and accountants were making more money than lawyers and lawyers were struggling. So the ABA start to study where were firms profitable. And they tracked firms like Reggie's firm and they discovered this incredibly profound insight. And if you're driving, 
You may want to just remember this insight. If you're listening to me on a treadmill, you may want to stop. You may want to write this one down because this one's a crazy idea. They discovered that lawyers who track their time made more money than lawyers who did not track their time. I know, crazy, right? So they figured out if you focused your time and tracked your time and focused your activities, you actually made more money than someone who came in the office and just started whacking away at emails and making phone calls and chasing stuff on their desk and being calendar driven, not focus driven.